Welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Pass Competitions Hub. In this video, we're going to be covering the Best Simulink Design Award winners for the 2017 season of the Best Robotics Competition. In this video, we're going to be showing you how the top scoring teams in the competition are using Simulink in order to program their robots. However, if you are not familiar with Simulink yet, I recommend you check out some of the links in the description of this video to get started using Simulink and Stateflow to program robots for the best robotics competition. In the agenda for today, we're going to be covering um, how to program controller dead zones into your robots, also how to implement dynamic speed controls, uh, how to use multi-button controls to include some safety into the programming of your robots, and finally, we're going to be covering a very basic form of scheduling actions that are repetitive and that you want your robot to perform by itself. Without further ado, we're going to jump right straight into the software demonstration. Um, and the first team that we're going to be covering is Council Grove High School. Uh, they were the Simulink winners at Frontier Trails Vest, and they had a really good example of how to implement controller dead zone. This is a Council Grove High School Simulink model. And in here, you'll see the different systems that they have programmed using Simulink. They have a limit switch system, an arm system, a locomotion system, and a front claw system. Uh, if we zoom into the locomotion system, you will see that they have used their joystick controls and their motors uh, to control the motors, but also they have used this dead band block. And the reason they have used this dead band block is because the motors can emit this whining noise when you give them a very small command. So by implementing a dead band, you can say that you're going to send a zero command if your input is anywhere from negative five to five in this case. And this is useful because it's going to make your motors last longer. And it's also useful because it's going to make your control, your controls for the robot a little bit less reactive. And this is good because uh, then you have a little bit more play in the controls and some of the drivers might be uh, more efficient using something like this. You can also use this block for other things other than driving. Uh, they are really useful in anything that's going to be controlled by a joystick. In this particular model, they also used it in the arm system, so to lift and lower the arm, and they included a dead band in this case that it's also negative 5 to 5, and this will just make it a little bit easier for the driver to control the arm. The next school that we're going to be looking at today is the Simulink Design Award winner for Texas Best, for the Texas Best Regional, and that's Ericsson Middle School. Uh, they did a couple of interesting workflows. One of them was using what's called segmented driving modes, and the other one was using multi-button control. So we're going to dive right into their Simulink model. In the Simulink model for Ericsson Middle School, you can see that they're using a state flow chart for their locomotion control. And in this state flow chart, what they've done is they've mapped each of the different conditions that the robot can be moving on. So depending on the direction and the, the position of the controllers, uh, you're going to be entering in one of these different modes. So it's going to be based on the input, which is the two joystick positions. Uh, and then the output is going to be one of these different states that they've programmed in here. And this is useful if you want to do something like move forward at one speed, but move backwards at a different speed, uh, maybe turn right at one speed, uh, but if you're going diagonally, do it at a different speed. So if you're looking for this very specific type of uh, speed control for your locomotion system, using a state flow chart like this can be very useful. The other thing that Ericsson Middle School uh, implemented in their simulating model that was really interesting was that they used two buttons uh, to control the release pin on their shooter. So in this case, they're not using one button, but two, so that there is some safety built into their programming so that their driver cannot accidentally hit one button and then shoot um, the robot. So in this case, you have to press both of the buttons at the same time, and then the motor will be activated. And if you're interested in understanding how they implemented this dual control logic, um, we can see in here uh, that it's an arrangement of different switches uh, using as input the buttons from the controller. The third simulating model that we're going to be covering today is that from Eastwood and Cornerstone Schools. They were the Simulating Design Award winners at the South Best Regional. And 
the interesting things that they implemented was that they simulated all of their controls before actually programming the robot. And this meant that they could try out different arrangements for their controls and simulate it without breaking anything on the robot or even without having a robot built yet. Uh, they also implemented dynamic speed controls for the locomotion system and I'll be showing you how, how they did that. This is the simulating model for Eastwood and Cornerstone schools. What they've done here is they've used our gamepad simulator block and this means that you can get inputs from either a Logitech or an Xbox controller and then you can get real-time feedback immediately while running it in Simulink without having a robot. So they've used this input to provide it to the drive system and in here you'll see that they have different types of control like dashboard blocks or a slider that you can use and move uh, and then they have some displays and they also have a, a field simulation that they can use to determine how the robot is moving based on how the motors are being actuated. Um, this is the first interesting thing they did. The other interesting programming approach here was that they created a state flow chart uh, that is controlled by a single button in the gamepad. And what this does is that it will increase or decrease the speed that the robot is moving at. So if you press the button, it will have a higher speed. And if you press it again, it will go back to a lower speed. And this can be really useful if your robot is picking up stuff. Uh, maybe it wants to move faster before it picks something up and slower after it picks it up, or depending on what your preference is. And the way they did it is they created a state flow chart that has two states, full speed or slow speed. And then the output of this state flow chart is going into some division blocks that are dividing the input from the gamepad joysticks. Finally, the last model we're going to be covering today is uh, by STEM High School, and they were the Simulink Design Award winners at the Denver Vest Regional Event. Uh, they implemented custom driver controls, so basically each driver could um, control the robot with the different controls depending on what their preference was and they also scheduled actions to be uh, completed repeatedly by the robot. Let's take a look at how they did this in Simulink. This is what the Simulink model for STEM high school looks like. Um, what they did here is that if you check out their process drive joystick data subsystem, it receives the input from the gamepad, which is here. They've also included the gamepad simulator block to simulate before uploading to the robot. And in this process drive joystick data, they've implemented not one, but two different types of controls for the robot. Uh, one of these flow paths is a tank robot configuration, and the other one is using our arcade block. Uh, so it means that this particular robot can drive either in tank configuration or arcade configuration, and it can change between these two by pressing one button in the gamepad. The other interesting thing about uh, STEM High School Simulink model is that they created a scheduler for their shooting mechanism. In this particular case, they had a rotating drum that had to rotate at a specific speed, and then uh, the way they shoot the balls had to be timed correctly. So in order to do that, they use a clock block and they divided it and got the modules from it. And they created this system with switches and with the time of the uh, simulation, or in this case, the time elapsed while the robot is running. And this meant that they could now have a time shooting partner. So it will shoot balls at a specific time interval. And this can be useful uh, to automate any sort of tasks in the competition if it's shooting something or picking something up uh, or even uh, moving to a specific location in timed intervals. The key takeaways from this video is that we covered a couple of different advantages that you get from programming using Simulink. So if you're using Simulink to program your robots for this season of the Best Robotics competition, uh, you can consider things like simulating your models before uploading it to the robot or just starting programming and using simulations to test your code before you have a robot built. You can also do custom driver controls, so you can adapt for different preferences of different drivers, or you can have dynamic speeds 
to have your robot move at different speeds depending on the direction or depending on a state that you can toggle using your gamepad. And the last thing we covered is that you can easily create some time-based action scheduling. So you can schedule things like shooting or picking up of objects by using some simple logic and our clock block in Simulink. Finally, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us by any of the means that you can see in the screen right now. We have an email address that is pastcompetitions.mathworks.com or you can ask your questions in our Facebook group.